The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Man Size in Marble. Listen now to original tales of the imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills. And now for tonight's story, a radio adaptation by Bob Olson of E. Nesbitt's story, Man Size in Marble. The villagers called it a delusion. That explanation gave them some comfort. Since it will give you comfort also, I'll say no more about it, except that it's difficult to understand how hallucinations can commit murder. Ours was one of those marriages on a dime. I'd been doing a bit of painting in those days and never knew what it was to have the money I really needed. But then Laura knew this before she married me. Well, we'll get along if we're careful. You can paint and, and I'll write articles for the magazine. Living in town will be out of the question, dear. Well, we can find some little place in the country. As long as it's picturesque and sanitary, it doesn't matter where it is. And so we spent our honeymoon lightheartedly looking for a place that was both sanitary and picturesque. The two qualities that rarely keep company in one cottage. Little rose-covered trellises would invariably hide the corruption that lurked inside. We'd looked so hard and were so confused by the eloquence of house agents that we seriously began to doubt if we could tell a house from a haystack, even if we found one. But when we came out to the little village of Brenzette, and thence two miles out to see the famous little church, our search was ended, for there, just two fields away, was the cottage. Picturesque it was, for it was long and low, with rooms taking off in unexpected directions. Two of the rooms were of ancient stonework, now covered with moss and ivy. It was all that remained of a huge manor that had stood here years ago. Around these rooms had risen the cottage as it stood this day quite by itself. Our nearest neighbor was a jolly Scotch doctor, McCarthy by name, whose cottage was a little distance down the lane. Our new home nestled cozily against a low hill and looked out across the marsh meadows to the sea. Yes, it was a pretty cottage. Though stripped of its roses and jasmine, it would no doubt have been hideous. The rent was absurdly cheap and it seemed quite likely that, between the two of us, we could keep the kettle simmering. We spent the rest of our honeymoon in second-hand shops, picking up odds and ends of oak and Chippendale until the cottage soon became very homey. Fully settled, we were so happy. And that day we looked from the latticed window onto the old-fashioned garden with its colorful splash of hollyhocks and lilies. Laura sat outlined against the window, I before my easel. What are you painting, Vance? You, my dear. Me? Well, why not this lovely countryside? Mm, first my wife, then the countryside. And uh, what are you writing? A verse. About what? You. <laughs> it was a gay life, the sort that only the quite humble or the very rich could enjoy. Our fortune was added to when we found Mrs. Dorman, a tall peasant woman with a good face and figure to keep house for us. Laura was delighted with her, for Mrs. Dorman was full of stories of the past, stories of the smugglers and highwaymen who dominated this part of England, cutting purses and throats with equal zest. Better still were her stories about the things that walked and the sights that one met of a starry night. They gave Laura a good deal of material for her articles, old wives' tales, I called them. Three months passed quickly. We hadn't had a single quarrel. That's why it startled me when on the return from a visit to Dr. McCarthy, Laura, who had always been so happy, rushed to my arms and buried her dark little head in my shoulder and wept. Laura, 
What is it? It's Mrs. Dorman. Well, what about Mrs. Dorman? She's leaving us. Leaving us? Well, what on earth for? She says that she must leave before the end of the month. She says that her niece is ill. But I don't believe her because, well, her niece has always been ill. She acted so, so queerly. Well, don't cry, Laura. You know, it's a terrible shock to see you cry. I might cry a bit myself just watching you. And you'd never respect me again. Oh, but it's serious. Those people in the village are so sheepy. And, well, if Mrs. Dorman leaves us without any explanation, no one will come and take her place. I just know it. Well, then we'll share the housework. But we'll have no time to earn what we need. And, oh, we've been doing so nicely now. We'll have to work all day and, and rest only when the kettle's boiling. Oh, you exaggerate, Laura. We'll have less time, but there'll still be time. However, when Mrs. Dorman comes back, I'll have a talk with her. We'll come to some sort of terms. Tell you what, let's take a walk up to the old church. The church was large and lonely, and we enjoyed the stroll in the moonlight. The path that went through a wood and along the crest of a little hill was called the Beer Path, for the dead had been carried along this path to be buried. The churchyard was enclosed by a low wall and ceiling by several large elms whose branches stretched out as if in benediction over the dead. We entered the old church from a long, low porch and through a heavy oak door studded with iron. Inside, the arches rose up into the darkness. We strolled up to the chancel where the fine colored glass windows let in faint hues of filtered moonlight. It gave everything a substance of, of shadow. Even the gray marble figures of the two knights who lay there in full plate armor with hands upheld in everlasting prayer. You know, it's a funny thing. If there is any light in this church at all, it seems to shine on these figures. Who are they? No one knows. The peasants say they were marauders, bandits, that they were the scourge of their day. Does it give you kind of a, a strange feeling to, to know they used to live where we live now? I hadn't thought much about it. Uh, has Mrs. Dorman told you the story? She doesn't know about it. She said the house was struck by a bolt of lightning. Mm, I heard it was the vengeance of heaven against their foul deeds. Funny how a pair like that would be given such an honored place in this little church. Well, the gold was good, no matter where it came from. Their heirs probably bought the honor. Mm, those marble statues certainly aren't flattering. Mm. From the looks on the faces, even in marble, I doubt their conversion to Christianity. The church looked very weird as the shadows cast eerie forms about. We looked again at the sleeping warriors and a feeling of awe came over us. Outside we sat on the ancient stone seats, gazing out across the moon-misted meadows. A sense of quiet and peacefulness came over us. At such times, troubles don't exist. Well, feel better than you did, dear? Yes, Van. Oh, let's never leave this place. It's lovely. Ah, oh, yes. Wasn't it silly to get all worked up over Mrs. Dorman? It's still a terrible nuisance. Mm, granted, but if scrubbing and blacking boots is the worst of our lot, we'll manage quite well even without Mrs. Dorman. Of course we will. And nevertheless, when we get back to the house, I'll have a talk to her. She should be there by now. I hope you can convince her. Uh, Mrs. Dorman, what's this I hear about your leaving? Well, I'd like to leave before the end of the month, sir. Well, aren't you happy here? Maybe you'd like a raise in your wages. It's not that, sir. You and your lady have been most kind. Well, then, uh, suppose we work it out so that you can stay. No, Mr. Longin, I'd rather leave my nieces ill. Yes, I know, but she's been ill all along. Uh, would you consider staying on for another month? No, sir. I want to leave before Thursday. But this is Monday, woman. That's rather short notice. I'll tell you what, stay on until next week. Maybe I can come back next week. But why must you go this week? Well, speak up. It's this house, sir. This house? Well, what about it? They saw that strange deeds was done here in olden times. In olden times? Oh, but this is now. What, what deeds do you mean? Well, don't worry, Mrs. Dorman. I, I'm not going to laugh at you. Well, sir... Have you seen them two shipes beside the altar in the church? You mean the effigies of the knights in armor? I mean them two bodies drawn out man-size in marble. A very graphic description, Mrs. Dorman, but uh, 
What about the knights? In the village, they saw that on All Saints' Eve, those bodies come to life. Those marble statues? They saw that they rise up from their slabs and walk down the aisle in their marble. Then when the church clock strikes eleven, they come out into the night and walks over the grind. But how do you suppose When the lights has been wet, there was the marks of their feet along the beer path. Well, where do they go? Back to their home. Their home? But their home was... In this house. Well, did anyone ever see this happen? I ain't sighing. All I know is what I know. Who was living here last year? No one, sir. The lady who owned the house spent the summer here, but... She always went up to London a good month before the night. And so you think you must go? Yes, sir. My niece is ill. Oh, your niece! Oh, very well, Mrs. Dorman. Go if you think you must. But don't say anything about this to Mrs. Langham. Must you go, Mrs. Dorman? Yes, ma'am. This is Thursday. I can't stay no longer. It's going to put quite a load on us. Don't try to do too much, Mrs. Langham. If there's anything I can do next week, well, I won't mind in the least. Thank you. Oh, but we'll try to manage. And whatever you do, lock the door early tomorrow night and mark the sign of the cross over it. What do you mean? Uh, that's Mrs. Dorman's little Halloween joke, dear. It's no joke. And if you ask me... Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Dorman. Goodbye, don't forget what I said. What did she mean, then? Nothing, dear. Mrs. Dorman is just a superstitious old biddy, that's all. I would have looked forward to Friday a much happier man if I could have believed what I had just told Laura. But Friday came the day before All Saints' Eve. The day this story ends. In fact, the day that gave this story its horrible substance. You are listening to Man Size and Marble in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. And now back to tonight's story, Bob Olson's adaptation of Man Size in Marble. I arose early that morning and had already built a rather smoky success of a fire when Laura came down as bright as the bright morning itself. We had breakfast and went after the housework. When the brushes and pails were silent at last, we spent one of the merriest days since our wedding. That afternoon, we took a long walk, completely happy, and Laura sweeter than ever. I decided that housework was good for her. We watched the deep flame of sunset as it slowly faded to a dull gray, and then walked back to the cottage hand in hand without a word. Once inside, we sat in the parlor and seemed to settle into a deep silence. I thought it was a happy silence, and what I asked Laura had no particular significance at the time. You seem sad, Laura. I was surprised at her answer. Yes, I, I don't think I feel quite well. I've had the shivers, and it isn't cold, is it? No, unless it's one of those nasty mists that creep up from the marsh. There is no mist, dear. Hmm, doesn't seem to be at that. Hmm, no mist. In that case, darling, you're not entitled to a chill. Sorry. Van, mm -hmm. do you ever have a presentiment of evil? Mm. Don't believe in them. I do. When my father died, he was away in North Scotland. But the night he died, I knew it. Oh, forgive me, Vance. Come and light up the candles on the piano, and we'll play one of our duets. Ten o'clock already. Light up your pipe if you like, Vance. I don't mind. Yeah, I think I'll take it outside. May I come too? No, dear. You're much too tired. I shan't be long. You get to bed or you'll be ill. You're taking good care of me, darling. Mm, have to. Can't do all this housework by myself, you know. Then give me a kiss. Mm, that will be a pleasure. Mm. Let me go with you. Uh -uh. You get some rest. Vance. Yes? We've been very happy today, haven't we? Mm, even happier than usual, sweetheart. 
You won't be gone long, will you? No, dear. Not long. I stepped out, leaving the door unlatched, for I expected to be back shortly. The night was magnificent. Huge masses of cloud, dark and heavy, seemed to clasp hands and reach from horizon to horizon. Through this flowing stream of clouds moved the moon, like a dolphin diving in and out of an endless succession of waves. The treetops swayed like a metronome to the gentle swing of the clouds. There was the mystic glow on the earth that comes from the blend of dew and moonlight. I drank in the serene beauty of the night. There wasn't a hint of emotion about. Not even a leaf stirred. The wind was high up, busy herding the clouds. Across the meadow, I saw the church tower standing out black against the sky. I suddenly thought of the three happy months I'd known here with Laura. Just then, the church sounded its bell. Hey, 11 o'clock. I should be getting back to the house. But first, I think I'll visit the church. I felt so happy and so very thankful. I wanted to take my gratitude to the old chapel that had heard the sorrows and the joys of its people for so many countless years. On my way, I passed our cottage and looked in the window where I saw Laura's dark little head silhouetted against the pale blue wall. She was very still. I decided not to disturb her. I turned down Beer Path. It was such a peaceful night that at first I was conscious of nothing. And then, suddenly, I became aware of a rustling sound that broke the stillness ever so gently. I stopped to listen. The sound stopped, too. I took another step and listened. The step seemed to echo my own. Well, if that's a poacher, he's a fool not to step more lightly. I left the beer path and took to the woods. The footsteps seemed to echo along the path I had just left. It was strange. Yes, it was strange. Ah, but then all night sounds are strange. I passed through the corpse gate and walked among the graves to the low porch of the church. The door was open. Hmm. Did I leave that open? I'd hate to have the damp get in and ruin those fine old fabrics. I went in and was halfway up the aisle when suddenly I remembered. That bell struck 11 o'clock. This is the very day the very hour when the shapes drawn out man's size in marble begin to walk. Once I did remember, it came on me with a shiver. And I was ashamed. And so to make up for it, I walked boldly to the altar. I did that because, well, because I wanted to tell Mrs. Dorman how peacefully the shapes had slept through the ghastly hour. And so with my hands nonchalantly shoved into my pockets, I passed up the aisle. In the dim gray light, the other end of the church looked more... Well, it looked larger than usual. The arches above the two tombs seemed to have grown, too. At that moment, the moon came out from behind a cloud, and in the ghostly beams of light, I... I saw the reason. They're gone! I steadied myself. It's... It's some fool's practical joke. They... They can't be gone. I, I, I'm not in the right place. It's, it's, it's too dark to see here clearly. Yes, that's it. I took a newspaper from my pocket and lit it with a match. It flared up brightly. The confirmation was sickening. The bodies drawn out man's size in marble had actually disappeared from the church. Suddenly I was gripped with an indefinable horror. It was an overwhelming certainty of finished calamity. I threw down the torch and dashed down the aisle, out the front door and into the night... They're gone. They're gone. Help me, someone. The bodies, they're gone. Said old Doon, man. Let go of me, you fool. The marble figures have gone from the church. They've disappeared, I tell you. Hey, they know. You've been smoking too much. Smoking and listening to old wives' tales. But, Doctor, I've seen the bare slabs with my own eyes. They're gone, I tell you. We'll come back with me. I'm going up to the Palmer's No. His loss is sick. We'll have a look into the bare slobs. Well, you can go if you like. I'm going home to Laura. Rubbish. I'll never permit it. You can't go around all your life as saying you saw a slab of marble in vitality. You can't do it, man. I'm not going back there. Then you want that you should be a coward? Coward? 
No, but... I, coward. I can help you if you didn't go down with me. Oh, all right. Come on. No, here we are at the church. Come in with me. I'm coming. Oh, what have you got your ears closed for? Here, I'll strike a match. No, look there. What have you had to drink, man? I opened my eyes, and what I saw made me absolutely mad. A huge black screen dropped across my reason. For there on the cold gray slabs were the two grotesque shapes in their marble. I... I... Dr. McCarthy, I, I simply don't know what to say. It must have been the light, or, or maybe I have been working too hard. <laughs> yes, you know, I I was sure they were gone. I am quite aware of that. You had to do something about that brain of yours. But, but wait, look at this hand. What's wrong with it, Doctor? It's been broken. There's a finger missing. Finger? But the last time I saw it, it was perfect. Someone may have tried to remove it. That can't be right. My impression was that they were gone. Completely disappeared. That was too much tobacco and painting. Perhaps. Well, come along, Dr. McCarthy. My wife will be getting anxious. I told her I wouldn't be gone long. Well, I should be going off to the Palmers. I'd appreciate it if you'd come on to the cottage with me and, and, and drink to my better senses. Or confusion to all ghosts or something. Well, it's pretty late, no... I had to see a lot of people to Nick. So I could go to the Palmers tomorrow. All right, I'll come with you. I believe I needed the sensible old doctor more than the Palmer girl did. You've had an illusion, man. Nothing more than an illusion. Yes, I fancy you're right about that, doctor. But it was a most amazing one. Dr. McCarthy then went into a dissertation on ghosts and apparitions as we walked on up to the cottage. When we reached the garden path, I was a little puzzled by the bright light that was streaming out the front door. Soon I saw that it was wide open. Had Laura gone for a walk? Well, come on in, Doctor. We'll find Laura and then pour ourselves a drop of whiskey. Good. The house was ablaze with candles. Laura had not only lit the wax ones, but there must have been a dozen other sputtering, glaring tallow dips stuck all over the room in odd little places. Laura! We have company. Oh, Laura. I wonder if she went out for a walk. Uh, Laura. Bunch. Yes? Look. Where? <gasps> Laura. There in the little recess of the window, I saw her. What had she been doing there? Looking for me? But the doctor said it before I quite dared to. Someone's been in this room. Has dinner belong here? Who? Yeah, I... Ooh. Laura didn't move. Her mouth was drawn and her eyes were wide open. Very wide. She looked as if she'd heard a footstep behind her and turned to meet. What? I passed my hands over her eyes. They saw nothing. What had they seen last? The doctor moved toward her, but I pushed him aside as if I were afraid of what he'd say. And then I took her in my arms. Laura, Laura, darling, I've got you now. You're safe. Aye, she's safe. She's dead. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> she fell into my arms like a limp, loose-jointed doll. I was slightly mad with this horrible sense of loss. But I knew she was dead. I knew it, and nothing mattered anymore. Laura was dead, and the world was dead. And I silently prayed that I might die. What's in her hand? I don't know. I don't care. Laura's dead. But the doctor pried open her fingers, and soon something fell out of that grim clutch and dropped to the floor. We looked at it, and then at each other. For what we saw was no hallucination. It seemed to fairly shriek its defiance to reason. For there on the floor was a gray marble finger. And so runs the tale of 
Man Size in Marble. Tonight's story was adapted from the story by E. Nesbitt entitled Man Size in Marble. Heard in tonight's program were Carl Grayson as Vance Langham, Beth Calder as Laura, Phyllis Perry as Mrs. Darman, and Archie Hugely as Dr. McCarthy. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. This program was written by Bob Olson and produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Thank you.